Sanchez is an institute for the history of science and culture. It was started in 1981 by Solomon Bachner, who was a historian both of science and mathematics, and wanted to get people together from both sides of the campus across disciplinary boundaries. So he started this society and it worked. It's been going ever since with both scientists and on the other side, humanists and social scientists. Sientia sponsors a series of lectures each year on a theme that we hope will be of general interest to a wide variety of people. This year's theme, as I said, is constructing the human. Apart from these lectures, we have occasional special programs like a panel after Katrina last year involving members of the community as well as the university, and each year our Bachner lecture. I just want to say a word or two about this year's lecture, who is Laurie Zoloth. She has two positions together. The first is the director of the Center for Bioethics Science Society. And she's pre uh, she is at the uh, Medical School of Northwestern uh, University, where she teaches medical ethics. She is also a professor of religion and a member of the Jewish Studies faculty at Northwestern University in the College of Arts and Sciences. She specializes in ethics in gener genetic me medicine. She does bioethics. She does neuroethics. She does stem cell research. She works on justice in healthcare allocation. She has been on the NASA Advisory Council, which is the highest civilian advisory council in the United States. She serves on NASA's Planetary Protection Advisory Committee. Talk about extending the human. Um, and on many, many, many other societies. So with her uh, wide variety of interests, her lecture we are hoping will be really Interesting, that's coming up in the spring. Apart from the Bachner, we have um, sponsored in the past and will continue to sponsor the uh, DeLang conferences. Next year we have DeLang number six on emerging libraries. It will also be coming up in the spring over spring break and has an astonishing array of important people who run the most important libraries and some of the most important universities on the planet. So uh, it looks like it's going to be a, a really extraordinary gathering and we're all looking forward to it. Before I get to our lecturer, I would like to thank Ellen Butler who takes care of everything from the wine and cheese to the uh, IT people who are recording the lecture every time and make it available to you on the web. Um, she accommodates to people like me who are just coming as a newcomer to the uh, group and uh, not too familiar with what goes on. She makes everything easy, thinks two weeks ahead of everybody else, and we couldn't do it without her. She's outside right now getting ready for us uh, and the reception just after the lecture. The lecture will be uh, about 50 minutes, maybe a little more. The panelists will answer and it will address the general topic uh, of the year. So I will first give you a quick review of what that topic is before getting more directly to Marsha O'Malley's specific interests. The question, what is man, Kant once observed, is the encompassing question for all philosophy. We know that individual human beings are constructed through development and the human species is constructed through evolution. But every time we think we can decide what the human is, we find how much we are inventing it in the process. We already remake our bodies through diet, fitness, surgery, and chemistry. And now the biotechnological <coughs> interventions extend the remaking process even further to prosthetics, tissue engineering, and genetic enhancement. Not only in science, but in languages, education, and culture, we find aspects of human endeavor that all conspire to fashion individual humans, a much debatable profit process that has questioned traditional categories like gender. The arts, too, serve to construct virtual humans, and next speaker will be addressing that. By considering the continuing construction and reconstruction of human beings, we can gain insight into our fundamental nature and its ever-shifting expression. 
Okay, now finally to today's speaker. Marsha O'Malley received the BS degree in Purdue University, 1996, and the MS and PH degrees in mechanical engineering from Vanderbilt University in 1999 and 2001. In 2001, she joined the Mechanical Engineering and Materials Science Department at Rice University, where she is currently an assistant professor. Her research interests now include nanorobotic manipulation and many things that I can neither pronounce or understand, but I'm sure she will tell you about them, and they have to do with robotic devices that help us and the interfaces between us and them. She is a 2004 Office of Naval Research Young Investigator. That's a, a selected and special title that she has won. And she is the recip recipient of an NSF Career Award, also in 2005. Additionally, she is the co-chair of the ASME Dynamic Systems and Controls Division Robotics Technical Committee and a member of the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society. Uh, along with other things, which um, I'm just uh, not going to go into, but many of them. She will speak today on robotics. While you may be familiar with commercial application of robotics that improve our efficiency, like the Roomba, or toy robots that entertain and teach children, like RoboSapien, there are a number of directions of robotics research that seek to extend human capabilities. Marcia's talk will discuss surgical robots, rehabilitation robots, and new applications of robotics for motor learning that have great potential. Applications range from enabling remote surgery, rehabilitating sufferers of stroke and spinal cord injury, speeding the acquisition of new motor skills, and potentially training amputees to use complex prosthetic devices. She will also discuss the implications of providing humans with skills beyond the innate or physiologically viable. The two discussants whom uh, Marsha will introduce more fully are Michael Dwyer Byrne from Rice and William E. Cohn, MD from Baylor College of Medicine and now join with me in welcoming them and beginning the lecture. Thank you for that introduction. You may be very familiar with the ways that robotics have been portrayed in the media. Often we see robotics portrayed as humanoid robots. You might think of Asimo, Honda's robot, or C-3PO from the Star Wars movies or even the recent movie, iRobot. And many times these portrayals of humanoid robots portray the robot as evil, if you think about Predator. Or robots become our pets, like Furby or the RoboSapien. But beyond your Roomba, or maybe the NASA rovers and uh, robotic uh, arms on the space shuttle and station, or industrial robots used in assembly lines, my bet would be that you might be hard pressed to come up with other examples of robots that benefit humanity. So in this lecture, what I want to do is present to you and a number of different robots and explore how these robotic devices can extend our own capabilities. Often these capabilities are limited by nature or impeded by natural occurrences. And so I'm going to focus today on a couple of areas, extending our reach as in telerobotics, and extending our capabilities in examples such as rehabilitation, augmentation, and prosthetics. The first area that I want to discuss is extending our, our reach via telerobotics. I'm going to focus on three general application areas, the first being remote and dangerous environments, the second being surgery, and the third being exploration or search and rescue. These systems extend our reach in a number of ways. They extend our reach over great distances. They extend our reach in scale and also enable us to go places that are inhospitable to humans otherwise. 
The first example I present to you is one that was very famous a couple years back. It's uh, the NASA JPL rovers enabling exploration of the surface of Mars. These are autonomous rovers designed for space. They can provide us images and even soil samples and give us this experience of being in a location that it's not feasible for us to go currently, but may be feasible in the near future. And so this gives us kind of an extension of ourselves located on Mars where we can interact with an environment that is foreign to us, but yet learn a lot about this environment. Telerobotics can also enable more direct manipulation with remote environments. These coupled interactions between a human and a remote environment enabled by a robot. An example of a system like this is the Robonaut system developed at NASA, Johnson Space Center just down the road, which I had the pleasure of working with um, over the last several years. First, I want to give you an explanation of a telerobotic system. In the top right, you've got a teleoperator. This is your human who is seated here in a chair and is immersed in this environment that is governed by the actions of the slave robot. The human operator wears a helmet-mounted display and sees a stereo view of the remote environment as seen through the cameras in the robot's eyes. Head movements and arm movements and chest movements of the human control those mimicking motions of that slave robot. And this pair of joysticks or force reflecting hand controllers enables this teleoperator to feel the force experienced as the robot squeezes on this soccer ball. And so now we have a more coupled interaction with a remote environment. And if we can overcome some challenges like communication over long distances and stability of this <coughs> position forward and force feedback system, then we can have truly immersed interactions with a remote environment that again may not be immediately accessible to us, but through robotic technology enables us to explore these faraway places. The bottom picture here shows a conceptual drawing of what that might be. Actually, it's kind of a mocked up photo. Right? So here's Robonaut, the humanoid slave robot, which has some degree of autonomy for very basic skills, like tracking an object in its environment. It can recognize an image in its field and move its head from side to side. Or if an object is inside its grasp, it can close its hand. But more gross actions of the robot are teleoperated, again, by a human who may be located somewhat nearby in distance, but may be at a great distance away, perhaps at a space station, on the shuttle, or even back here on Earth. This would enable geologists here on Earth to directly interact with the soils and rock samples on Mars and, and gain more firsthand understanding. And you could even imagine then teams of robots and humans working together to explore these environments. So here we have an astronaut coupled with this teleoperated robot to explore Mars. These systems can also be used beyond space exploration for applications like nuclear cleanup, underwater exploration, and even exploration to the far reaches of the Earth like Antarctica or deserts. The second area of teleoperation that I'd like to discuss is surgical teleoperation. <clears throat> this is another example of extending our reach here now more in scale, and I'll talk about that in, in a minute, than in distance um, for its intended use. This is the Da Vinci surgical robot developed and sold and, and located across the street at the Texas Medical Center, many systems across the street, uh, by a company called Intuitive Surgical out of Sunnyvale, California. The basic principle of the Da Vinci system is as follows. You've got a master station, just like we had with the other teleoperation setup, where the surgeon sits at this console, and I'll give you some more details about this console on the next slide. You've got a slave system where the patient is located, and perhaps some residents or attendings assisting with that surgery. Here is a close-up of the slave. You've got multiple robotic arms inside the belly of the patient doing the actual surgical maneuvers. This system 
is intended for minimally invasive surgery. You can see here you've only got a few incisions in the patient. The benefits of this are improved recovery times, decreased morbidity due to these smaller incisions. It offers numerous benefits over traditional laparoscopic surgery, however, and I'd like to talk about those next. Perhaps you've had a minimally invasive surgery yourself with traditional <coughs> laparoscopic tools, but there are advantages that using the robotic system can provide over those handheld tools alone. For example, I'd like to highlight three of those capabilities here. The first capability of the da Vinci system is a stereoscopic display. So now you've taken a procedure, when done laparoscopically requiring these long lever arm tools and a significant amount of training and a view through a 2D camera video feed, and you've mapped that now to a stereoscopic display at the surgeon's console. Now the surgeon sits at this console, looks through the stereo display, and his hands, or her hands, are located right underneath that display. Now you've transformed this laparoscopic minimally invasive procedure from looking at a television screen and doing complex mappings to control your laparoscopic tools to an environment that feels very much like open surgery. Another benefit of the da Vinci system is the third arm. Right? How many times working in your garage or at home have you wished you just had an extra hand to hold a tool? The da Vinci system enables this. And so the Again, the master console allows switching between two of the three arms at any given time. So you can be working with two arms, clutch and hit a switch, and now you're working with one arm and a, and a third arm, enabling you to hold additional tools, clamp uh, or retract, and position a camera as well. The third uh, feature of the da Vinci system is improved dexterity. In traditional laparoscopic tools for minimally invasive surgery, you have only translation and maybe gripping to do tasks. These tools enable a full seven degrees of freedom, three degrees of translation, three degrees of rotation, plus grasping. And so you get this very natural motion like you get of your own wrist. And because of the setup of the surgeon's console, again, it's just as if you're doing open surgery with your own hands. This becomes very natural and thus the name intuitive. The full system put together offers some additional features that extend our capabilities as humans. You really get the feel that you're immersed in this open surgical environment, but you get all the benefits of minimally invasive surgery. In addition, if you've had too much coffee, <laughs> the system can filter tremor from the master station to the slave it can also do position scaling up and down so that you get additional improved dexterity over what you would be capable of doing normally. Also, you're, in a, you're able to re-index and move around a workspace much like you move your mouse on your mouse pad to reach the extents of your computer screen. You can re-index the master manipulators of the da Vinci system and interact with a very large workspace while maintaining that fine manual control. The third area of teleoperation that I'd like to discuss today is search and rescue. Search and rescue is another area that has really benefited from robotics because now we can put these mobile robotic devices into places where we cannot physically go. The top left picture is Robin Murphy at the University of Central Florida who first deployed her rescue robots at the 9-11 site in New York City. This was the first known actual use of search and rescue robots in an urban setting. <clears throat> the robots were used to do a number of tasks. They were used to search for victims, to search for paths through the rubble that would be quicker to access for the human rescue teams, structural inspection, and detection of hazardous materials. These robots were able to go into places that were still on fire where actual search and rescue per personnel would not obviously be able to go. They were teleoperated, but provided images back to the human operators, giving us this view into places that we could not reach before. Much research in mobile robots has focused on issues of locomotion and mobility. 
also autonomy. Right, so while these search and rescue robots used at uh, the World Trade Center site were teleoperated, there is obviously a desire to have robots that can act autonomously that we can set free to do tasks for us and gather information to bring back to us. I have a couple examples of mobile robots that have been designed mimicking nature. We can look at the robustness of cockroaches, especially here in Houston, and how they maneuver over numerous different kinds of terrains, and yet never seem, you can't stop them, right? Or even grasshoppers and their ability to jump very far. If we can capture those natural tendencies, those natural characteristics of insects and mimic them in mechanical devices, then again we're extending our own capabilities and our own reach in exploring unknown environments or in being successful for search and rescue. The first example I'd like to show you is a robot called RHEX that was developed at the University of Michigan. This robot was designed to mimic kind of a cockroach gait. It flails its legs with no apparent rhyme nor reason and crosses terrain quite effectively. If we were to do very detailed motion planning and calculations on the kinematics and dynamics of this robot, we could probably come up with a workable gait. But it's interesting that nature shows us that sometimes flailing is very effective. And so you can see this RHEX traversing a fairly rugged terrain in the woods, probably somewhere in Michigan, um, and making decent progress. This same principle can be applied when you look at the robustness of this same robot. So it looks <laughs> like a death-defying fall. At the end, notice how the legs reconfigure themselves, put the robot back in a gate, and it's ready to again flail itself across the, um, the terrain. And so a lot of lessons can be learned here and that we can look to Mother Nature for inspiration in our robotic design to give us tools that will let us access environments that are not necessarily uh, welcoming to humans. I have another example of a mobile robot here. You have to put up with Microsoft for a second. This is Sprawlita, designed at UC Berkeley to mimic kind of a grasshopper gait. Extremely robust robot. I wouldn't do this to any of my robots in the lab. Um, but you can see the flexibility built in. You can see, uh, again, some interesting design in the orientation of the legs. But again, basically just firing these things rapidly uh, and a very effective forward gait. Also able to traverse rough terrain. And just a little bit noisy. I've got the sound muted because you can actually hear the grad students in the background of this video. <laughs> but, but what you see here is a great, another great example of biomimetic design of mobile robots capturing what Mother Nature has to offer, mimic, mimic, excuse me, mimicking it in mechanical design, and really taking advantage of these abilities in locomotion, which is a huge challenge in mobile robots right now. We will revisit mobile robots and bio-inspired design a little bit later in my talk. The third area that I'd like to discuss is human augmentation. There are two primary areas that I'm going to focus on. The first is increasing human strength and load carrying capacity. And the second is restoration of function. So some more great examples of mechanical design. <laughs> this is General Electric's Hardyman. It was designed in the 1960s. It's a fabulous teleoperation system. <clears throat> this system was the first serious attempt to build a powered exoskeleton that could multiply the strength of the operator enough to allow him or her to lift 1,500 pounds as if it was nothing. 
The intended applications were for use aboard, aboard aircraft carriers for bomb loading, underwater construction, in nuclear power plants, and in outer space. So again, many of these same concepts of allowing us to go places we cannot go on our own. Unfortunately, by, the 19, by 1970, only one arm was built, shown in the figure here on the left. It was functional. It, would, it could lift 750 pounds and met all the design specifications. But it weighed 3 quarters of a ton. <laughs> right. So many of these limitations are due to power. Right. High density power sources uh, for actuation are limited. You've got to have some kind of power supply and you've got to have heavy motors or actuators that enable you to carry these sorts of loads. And in, the in 1970, this technology did just did not enable these kinds of capabilities. And so the project was tabled and faded away, except to be used by robotics faculty members in lectures. <laughs> the idea didn't die. If you're a fan of the Aliens movies, you may recall this scene from Aliens where Ripley enters the loader to fight the alien and triumph. Right? So, I, I believe this is from a museum. Um, I thank Google, vi uh, Google Images for this picture. Uh, but here is Ripley in the power loader fighting the alien. Again, intended to increase her strength, her, her uh, uh, stamina to fight this alien and, and have victory for humankind. But unfortunately, in the 80s, this was kind of limited to, uh, to Hollywood. But I'm pleased to say that in modern day, we are able to realize this goal. DARPA uh, started a project in the late 1990s, early 2000s, called the Exoskeletons for Human Performance Augmentation. The project was aimed to increase speed, strength, and endurance of soldiers in combat environments. The goal was to have a system that was self-powered, human-controlled, and wearable. You can see the concept sketch here on the left hand side and the actual physical realization of this exoskeleton on the right hand side. One of the primary challenges as I mentioned in exoskeletons is power and power dense actuation. The Center for Intelligent Mechatronics at Vanderbilt University has developed a monopropellant actuation system that is extremely power dense. There's a single tank of propellant and a catalyst used, and the exhaust is steam, a slight problem to deal with when you've got this on humans because it exhausted about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. They're working on that. <coughs> but you can see here the human operator is wearing only a position sensor. It's a, a, a potentiometer on the elbow to track angle of the elbow. And that control signal is going to the actuation system powered by this monopropellant to do some pretty hefty bicep curls. This is one possible uh, solution for powering the DARPA exoskeleton and provides that power dense actuation that's needed to meet the criteria of the project. University of California at Berkeley has a fully working prototype of the DARPA exo of one of the DARPA exoskeletons. And so you can see in this video the human operator walking around with the powered exoskeleton lower limb system carrying probably about a 100 pound or 150 pound pack on his back. This is another grad student. <laughs> this Prototype exoskeleton. Is he yes. The battery? Uh, yes. In this case, he is wearing all the batteries, and the life is fairly limited. Wow. This system, along with other prototype exoskeleton systems like the one pictured here, developed by Sarcoast, are currently being evaluated for feasibility as uh, to be adapted or adopted by the military for full implementation. So you can see here this example 
of augmenting human strength and human capability through robotics and robotic design. And we are very close to having an actual functional, widely dispersed system for doing so. Another application of interest specifically to my lab here at Rice is augmentation for rehabilitation. In this case, you have a patient who suffered a stroke and has some loss of motor function in one limb. Right? The, le the picture on the right-hand side shows the idea of the patient <clears throat> with the impaired limb strapped in to this combination Puma robot and exoskeleton device. The original system, which just consisted of the Puma for rehab, this is an old 1960s era industrial robot. Was adapted in the early 1990s for stroke rehab and enabled shoulder and elbow extension for stroke patients. So you could put your forearm in a, in a, um, in a brace and move that robotic arm or have the robotic arm move your own arm from position to position to <clears throat> enable recovery and retrain that motor control pathway from the brain to the limb. Here at Rice, we've extended the capability of this robotic system to enable elbow extension coupled with forearm pronation and supination, wrist flexion extension, and radial and ulnar deviation. The video on the left-hand side shows one mode of this robot in operation where <coughs> the uh, robot carries the patient, you can imagine the limb in this device, from one location to another, coupling motion of the elbow and the forearm and the shoulder together. We can also demonstrate that through robotic assisted rehabilitation, we can do things like forearm pronation. And so the video in the bottom will show you that rotation of the forearm as the extension is taking place. This is just one example of a system, a robotic assisted rehabilitation system, that's enabling improved recovery times from chronic and acute stroke. They're also being used for spinal cord injury and other applications as well. So far, we've discussed a number of robotic systems that enhance human function or capabilities or attempt to restore human function and capability back to what was uh, had before injury, primarily aimed at benefiting society. But I'd like to go a little beyond that now and discuss how we might have devices or systems that extend our own capabilities beyond what was ever physiologically realizable. going to change slides for me. I talked a while ago about the importance of using Mother Nature as inspiration for mechanical design. And we saw a number of examples, both of the robotic cockroach and the robotic grasshopper, that were very successful at improved locomotion over rough terrain when we used Mother Nature as inspiration. A big problem in those mobile robotic systems, though, as I mentioned, was power. And you may have even noticed in the video of Sprawlita that there were some cables coming off the back of the robotic device. That was a pneumatically actuated robot, and as a result, needed a source of compressed air to fire the pneumatic actuators. And so we might think how we could extend the influence of Mother Nature even farther for our mobile robotic devices. One of the most adaptable creatures on Earth is the common rat. This is a really fascinating book called Rats, Observations on the History and Habitat of the City's Most Unwanted Inhabitants, <laughs> written by Robert Sullivan. So I recommend this book for you. But there are some researchers at a university in New York at SUNY that have taken the robustness of the rat to many new levels. This is RoboRat. 
Robo rat is a common rat that is controlled via a direct brain interface. The rat is controlled by the scientist sending signals to the rat's brain that control its actions directly. First, they tie into the whisker regions of the brain. That's how a rat would normally navigate through its whiskers. And so they would indicate a right turn or a left turn to the rat by firing these regions of the brain. And then, as we all need, you provide the rat some reward when the rat has gone the direction that you have indicated. This robotic rat has a number of components. There's the rat pack. This is all from nature. All right. The rat pack is a backpack with a remote controlled microstimulator that delivers pulses to the rat's brain. There are two different areas of the brain mirrored that are focused in on. In the top um, exterior regions are the areas of the brain that control the whiskers. And in the central region of the brain is that region that senses reward or pleasure. And so by stimulating these whisker regions and the reward regions, you can get this rat to follow a desired trajectory. So the figure at right demonstrates an experiment that was carried out. And so the rat here are made to look much cuter than they are in real life, if you ask me, <laughs> wears his little backpack and heads up these this ladder across this rod, down these stairs, through the uh, little obstacle course, and down the ramp. There are a series of red and green dots in this <coughs> image. And so just to clarify what's going on, the red dots indicate the rat head position at one second intervals. So you can kind of track where the rat is as he goes through this course. The green dots indicate the locations at which rewards were given through that direct brain stimulation. The blue arrows indicate the positions at which right or left directional cues were given to the rat. And so those are primarily at the points where you're kind of changing your direction, which you would expect. And the black arrows indicate the positions a half a second after those directional commands. And so you can see that here a command was given, and then a half a second later, the direction of the rat is in response to that directional command. The use of RoboRat beyond kind of a really gee whiz gadget might be for pest control. <laughs> Again, this is straight from the article. Pest control, military surveillance, or mapping of underground areas. But some important things are taking place here. We're transitioning from trying to mimic Mother Nature with our mechanical design of our locomotion system for our mobile robot. And here we're harnessing what Mother Nature already provides as a very efficient, power-dense platform for mobile robotics. And so for some lettuce, and carrots, <laughs> and whatever else they eat, you can power this rat for a significant amount of time. You don't have to worry about pneumatics and batteries and actuation for this rat. All you have to worry about is how you're going to do that control interface. And here they've successfully done it through direct brain interfaces. This has also been successful in cockroaches and other small animals. Um, but the rat example is the most well known and um, that I was able to find in the literature. And so naturally, you might start to think about how we can extend this harnessing of Mother Nature into our own abilities to extend human capability. Leave it to DARPA to come up with another project to motivate us to think about how we might extend human capability. The latest project that they are proposing, of many, is revolutionizing prosthetics 2009. And I had the pleasure to be at the uh, National Academy's Keck Futures Initiative workshop just this past week on smart prosthetics, where we discussed this very goal and how we can integrate mechanical design and 
interfacing with our own neural control systems and providing sensory feedback to have a set of prosthetic devices that are as natural as our own human limbs or potentially even more capable. This figure appeared in Trends in Neuroscience in earlier this year and so it demonstrates here a prosthetic arm that looks cosmetically like our own but contains mechanical actuators with both significant power and accuracy, touch and position sensors to provide that sensory feedback that is so important when we interact with the environment around us, a portable controller, presumably also having those battery packs or maybe a few rats, <laughs> and a wireless link to a fully implantable multi-channel recording device that somehow interfaces with our own neural control system so that we can control this prosthetic limb very naturally. This is a conceptual drawing, but I'd like to show you a few examples of how we're moving closer to the idea of a smart prosthetic for humans. The first is the idea of a powered prosthetic device. Many prosthetic devices on the market now are passive. They're designed of very intelligent materials, they behave uh, naturally, but they are passive devices. And if you look at human gait especially, you need active action between the heel strike and push off of the ground to have natural human gait. Similarly, when prosthetic limbs for the upper extremities, you need powered devices that can enable us to lift objects, to grasp things, and to truly interact with our environment. And so this example here shows you a powered lower limb exos I'm sorry, powered lower limb uh, prosthesis for gait. Uh, the challenges are much greater for upper extremity. One approach that's been very successful in prosthetic control is targeted reinnervation. This is Jesse Sullivan. You may have seen him on the news last spring. He has a powered prosthetic device. This was developed and uh, he was operated on at the Rehab Institute of Chicago. This prosthetic limb is controlled through a process of muscle reinnervation. Effectively, they took the nerves that were existing in the stump that remained of Jesse's arms. He lost his two arms. Uh, I think he was an electrician uh, and lost them uh, in an accident. Uh, both arms had to be amputated. So you take those nerves that used to go to the limb and you re them to another location in the body. In Jesse's case, the nerves were re to the pectoralis muscles in the chest. What this enables Jesse to do is to contract the muscles of his chest, to contract his pecs, which normally would be used to control the upper limb, which he no longer has, but to now control this powered orthotic uh, prosthetic device. But you'll notice a couple things. Despite the ability he has to control this prosthetic device, it's fairly limited in its capabilities. He has range of motion that's fairly impressive, but not the seven degrees of freedom range of motion that we have of our own arm. It's also not a very smooth or natural control because he's had to retrain his own motor control system so that contractions of his pectoralis muscles now control this robotic prosthetic device rather than controlling his limb in a more natural way. And you'll notice that the capabilities of the prostheses that he wears on each uh, arm are very different. And it takes a significant amount of assistance from outsiders to be able to don and doff this prosthetic, these prosthetic arms so that he can actually have this function. And so we've made some progress with this example. We have a powered prosthetic device. It doesn't yet have the capabilities of our own human arms, but he's able to control this with his own intent through contraction of muscles in other parts of his body. What would be truly ideal is direct brain control of a device. So rather than thinking I need to contract these other muscle groups, now all I have to think is I want to reach out and touch something. We aren't there in humans, 
but this has been demonstrated with primates. This is the work of Andy Schwartz at the University of Pittsburgh. He is using a direct brain interface on a monkey to have this monkey control a prosthetic limb. There are a whole series of videos that are extremely interesting about Andy's work. But all that's happening here is a reward mechanism. When the monkey correctly thinks to reach, those areas in the brain that are associated with that forward reaching movement are mapped to control this prosthetic device. The prosthetic device is then controlled to reach out, grab that food reward, and he has to then bring that food reward back to its mouth. It's controversial work. It certainly is nowhere near being ready for testing in humans, but it is a step towards this idea of direct brain control of mechanical devices to restore function in humans who have lost limbs. What lacks in this system still is sensory feedback. It's lacking in Jesse Sullivan's system and it's lacking in the system that Andy Schwartz has developed. And so while that animal or Jesse are able to reach out and grab objects, they have no sensation of the properties, the mass, the texture, the flexibility of the objects that they're picking up. And so one goal of the Smart Prosthetics Workshop that I attended and of the DARPA Revolutionizing Prosthetics Program is to incorporate all of these features, direct brain control, whether through the brain or through peripheral nerve or some other access to the central nervous system, and true sensory feedback which might inc include cutaneous feedback, temperature, proprioception, and kinesthetic feedback of forces that you're interacting with. It's a huge challenge, and the goal is to do this by 2009. So I'd like to conclude with this quote, and I think it's very appropriate, that technology progresses from primitive to complex to simple. If you think about the robotic devices that I showed, especially those from uh, earlier in the talk, while they may be somewhat complex mechanically, their capabilities are somewhat primitive. We've got flailing robotic limbs on mobile robots. We've got teleoperation systems that have limited degrees of freedom. Or we have prosthetic limbs that can only reach out and grasp and not enable that rich sensory feedback. I conjecture that we're right now in the middle of complex. Right? We're trying to do a whole lot of things with artificial systems, mechanical design, integration of systems. And we're succeeding, but the results are complex and we are introduced with a whole new suite of problems. How do we power these systems? How do we maintain these systems? And how robust are these systems for practical use? The goal would be simple. And I think we're seeing glimpses of this with the work in direct brain interfaces for prosthetics, where we're really harnessing what Mother Nature has to offer and integrating with that. But I would like to pose that this brings up some very important questions that we all must consider. Suppose we are able to make prosthetic devices that, out, that outperform our own human limbs. We're actually not far from this. The land speed record in track and field is about to be broken by a man who's a double amputee and the prosthetic legs that he wears enable him to reach ground speeds that are nearing and potentially exceeding what healthy humans can do. So would we consider voluntary amputation? We already do designer surgeries and augmentation, so why not get a better arm or a better set of legs? We also might have to consider issues of coercion, especially in military applications. Imagine if we have these prosthetic devices or these lower leg exoskeletons and we move to direct brain interfaces. Are we going to force our troops to take on these things, to integrate these machines with their bodies, to improve their capabilities, to give us the edge up in times of war? How do we make sure that these advances in technology are available to all users? and not just those who can afford it. And finally, who will pay those bills? That concludes my talk. And I'd like to take this time to introduce the panelists 
and hear their comments as well. Uh, our panelists today are Mike Byrne, Associate Professor in Psychology and Computer Science here at Rice, whose research is in human-computer interaction, and Dr. Billy Cohn, who's in surgery at Baylor College of Medicine. I'll turn it over to you guys. So I'm going to get all my kids robotic cockroaches. <laughs> uh, you know, speaking from just our world, robotics, uh, you know, that intuitive da Vinci system, we have one at the Texas Heart Institute where I'm uh, the director of minimally invasive heart surgery. And uh, <clears throat> when they first introduced that, you know, it was like a big marketing thing, and hospitals all over the country were really eager to get them and try to do robotic heart surgery. Uh, but our, our, my initial impression, a lot of people's initial impression, is that it was the tail wagging the dog. Here they made this great tool, and we were really martyring ourselves, and to a lesser extent our patients, trying to use it to build these robotic programs. And a lot of people that bought these robots initially, thinking they were going to build these big robotic heart surgery programs, uh, ended up putting the robots in closets where they accumulated dust because it was a very difficult endeavor. In fact, I remember uh, Dr. Cooley, who's a senior member of our group, who many of you probably know, uh, was at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons meeting maybe two or three years ago. At that point, there were two surgical robotics companies. There was Intuitive that makes a Da Vinci, and then there was Computer Motion. And subsequently, due to some IP issues and stuff, uh, Intuitive bought out Computer Motion, so now there's this one. But at that point, there are two robotics companies, the Da Vinci that you just saw there, and the Computer Motion System, which was three modular, smaller systems. And at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons meeting, they had both of these systems set up at opposite ends because they were competing companies. And I was walking around with Dr. Cooley. And we went over to Computer Motion, the one that had the smaller modular system. And uh, Dr. Cooley sat there and watched, and all the people from Computer Motion were all like, oh, you know, Dr. Cooley, staying at attention and stuff. And one of them finally had the nerve to come up and say, uh, Dr. Cooley, did you have a chance to see both robotic systems? He goes, yeah, yeah, I did. And he goes, which one do you like better? And he goes, well, I think I prefer this one here. And they're all like looking and smiling. He goes, because when everybody starts throwing them away, the modular component will make it easier to put them in a BFI trash bin. <laughs> <laughs> and in some ways, he was somewhat clairvoyant because he was right. A lot of the people that tried to jump on this bandwagon realized it was really neat technology, but not really ap well applicable to heart surgery. That said, in the last couple years, people have started to say, wait a second, you know, we've got this one and a half million dollar beautiful robot that has all the functionality that you just beautifully described, seven degrees of motion, tremor filtering, beautiful 3D immersion environment. It really is a beautiful piece of engineering, and yet we're trying to do the operation the same way we did when we had three surgeons, 30 fingers, three pairs of eyes, assistants, all this stuff. We didn't redesign the operation, we tried to do the same operation. And now the, a couple people that have survived this horrible learning curve of beating their head against the wall trying to do this are slowly redesigning the operation and making great progress. In the last month, I've moderated two of these live telesurgeries where a guy in Sadir Srivastava, who's a leader in this field in Midland, Odessa, of all places, out in the middle of nowhere, has built this robotics program. And some of the things that he does that now I watch and go, of course, that are so simple. The way he starts sewing the two arteries together before the arteries peeled off the back of the breastbone, using the breastbone as his assistant. And just some of these crazy things that he's come up with that allow you to overcome the fact that you've got no sense of touch, and you've got no assistant, and you've got no this and no that. Just basically redesign the operation. He made it look really easy. And I think that there's a glorious future for uh, robotics and surgery if we can just step back and say, let's forget everything we know and start from the very beginning. Uh, so anyway, I think it's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful challenge to clinicians to come up with ways to use robotics to make uh, the operations we do less invasive. And uh, I think I'm gonna probably devote uh, the next couple of years of my life uh, working in that area. Anyway, I thought it was great to talk. Okay, I, I wanna take a slightly different tack on this. Uh, my background is in cognitive psychology, and of course, 
when the question, the original question for this semester, this year, Santa was raised, um, was what is it that makes people people? Um, and of course, if you're a cognitive psychologist, the answer has to be, well, it's cognition, right? What is it that makes people different than other species? Well, first of all, it's because we continually ask the question of what is it makes us different than other species. We're the only one that does that. Um, but the argument really has been for a long time in many corners that, the, that what makes people unique and different is their cognitive capabilities, right? We acquire cognitive capabilities in the course of our lives that no other species acquire, and we acquire capabilities that evolution couldn't really have anticipated, right? Almost everybody learns some relatively complex cognitive skill that most other species can't learn, or if they could, it takes a really, really long time, like algebra, right? <laughs> Monkeys don't learn algebra. You could maybe train some non-human primates to learn. Essentially, the rules of algebra takes a really, really, really long time to do it. Um, so the argument for a long time has been that it's cognition that makes us separate or makes us different. And so the question I think that Marcy's talk raises very interestingly is what about these other capabilities? What, what, what is it that makes us human with respect to particularly motor capabilities? And that's an interesting question because in fact, as far as perceptual motor capabilities are concerned, people are not, humans are not particularly special animals. <clears throat> and I mean that quite literally. You know, the human visual system is not an especially astounding visual system relative to most other mammals even. Um, you can know a lot of what we know about how the human visual system works, we learn from cutting up cats, all right? The cat visual system is very similar to the human visual system. Similarly, the human motor system isn't all that more advanced than most other primate motor systems. Um, anyway, anything that has opposable thumbs pretty much qualifies um, in terms of what human motor capabilities have, we have. We, we aren't particularly special on, on that. And in other senses, we're much, much, much worse than any other than most, many, 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 many other species. So in olfaction, humans actually have particularly poor olfactory capabilities relative to most other mammals. Um, uh, hearing, we don't have particularly good hearing, especially when you compare against other mammals like bats. Right? So these kinds of capabilities are not what make humans special, particularly because lots of these capabilities are shared with other kinds of other species. <clears throat> but by the same token, we are not and I, I had great pictures from Google Images, but they didn't work on Marcy's laptop, so you can't see them, um, of brains in vats, right? We aren't brains in vats. We are, are, are these great cognitive capabilities we have, the ability to learn algebra and play chess and stuff like that, um, is still attached to a, a very complicated perceptual motor system. And in fact, there's a lot of argument that perhaps those perceptual motor capabilities really help define what the cognitive system needs to do. <clears throat> So I want to talk a little bit about how, how those perceptual motor capabilities might define what's in the cognitive part. Um, a common misconception, a common story, uh, when I talk about perceptual capabilities in my undergraduate courses, um, as people often ask when we're, when we're overviewing sensory systems, um, do blind people really hear better than sighted people? Right? There's a common myth that that's true, and in fact, that myth is not true depending on how you want to answer that question. If you take a bunch of people who are congenitally blind or acquired blindness early in life and you test their auditory sensitivity or acuity or ability to spatially localize, it's not any better on average than people who haven't lost sight. What's changed is how people think about hearing. Right? People who have lost their sight know what to listen for, know how to interpret sounds, know how things sound in certain kinds of contexts that most people that, that have sight don't pay any attention to. Right? Our perceptual motor capabilities really influence how we structure our thinking. <clears throat> right? um, so one of the things that's, that's really interesting is that people adapt their strategies for how they do large complicated tasks in ways that are sensitive to very small details of perceptual motor costs or trade-offs between perception and cognition. So one of the great, uh, in, I study human computer interfaces, one of the greatest events in human computer interface in a long time was the development of the graphical user interface, right? Where now you have pictures of icons and files and you click things and you drag things and you interact with representations of things. Before we had this, and my undergraduates now don't remember this. <laughs> Before we had these things, we had line printers and you had to type in these arcane commands, right? And to know how to do something to a file, you had to remember the full name of the file and type a command that specified the name of that file, right? It was very intensely cognitive. People could do it, 
small collections of people called computer scientists at universities mostly did it. Um, and guys writing giant COBOL programs at banks did it. Uh, but by and large, most people didn't do it. But when the task was changed from a mostly cognitive task to a mostly perceptual motor task, right? you see the file, you want to get rid of it, you drag it into the trash. Right? Um, when it was changed to this task that relies heavily on our other capabilities, suddenly it became accessible to wide audiences. Right? So what our perceptual motor capabilities are may not change how our brain is wired up, uh, but it certainly changes the way we think about things and certainly leverages our ability to adapt to new tasks that we couldn't have anticipated. Is one of the roadblocks um, to the surgical robot the, the tactile feedback? Uh, and then the second follow-up question would be to Marcy and the issues uh, associated with that. Yeah, I mean, clearly, uh, surgery is a tactile sport, you know? <laughs> running your fingers over little things, trying to feel where the grid is that shows there's a blockage that you can't see with your eyes, but you know it's inside. Knowing how hard you can pull on something, uh, feeling the resistance of a needle to find the right place to pass it through tissues. But like you were just saying, you can certainly learn uh, to pay more attention to other cues when you're deprived of that. And just like a non-sighted individual learns to listen and go, oh no, no, that was a drop of water on a tile floor with nothing on the walls. I mean, uh, because they're less distracted by other cues, you learn to say, well, if I grasp and pull this hard and it tents out that much, it must have this elastic modulus. And you start to learn different ways of uh, perceiving your world through three, 3D videoscopy. Also, remember, you know, you've got an eye on a stick, basically, two eyes. And it goes, you know, through, now they have cameras where it multiplexes it down the same thing, and the camera's out here. but the robot has two fiber optic tracks that bounce like this. They go to two high resolution digital cameras. They go to two giant high resolution CRT screens that through prisms give you a different image for each eye. So the 3D perception is amazing. The patient's over here. You drop a needle that's too small to see with your naked eye. On your, for your world, it's this big and you're grabbing it. And when you drop it, you go and lean forward to try to pick it up, even though it's over there. You are immersed with a capital I, okay? Uh, so, uh, but you can take that little two pinpoint 3D eye and you can put it on there and see things that you've never seen before. You'll be peeling down the mammary artery, the artery that runs on the back of the breastbone that provides blood to the muscle and bone that we use as a graft. And you're looking at it, it's this big. And you're peeling away stuff that in, in thousands of cases, you've never gotten a view like that. And does that compensate for not having a sense of feel? Yeah, it sure does. Well, let me make a, a comment on that. I think one of the reasons that the Da Vinci has been so successful is that the great visual feedback, this true sense of immersion that you get, has been adopted by practitioners in the field. And it does increase kind of your own function as you operate. But there is a lot of anecdotal feedback that the tactile sense, that haptic feedback, would be very beneficial. Absolutely. Um, it's a significant challenge for two reasons. One, um, from an engineering standpoint, how do you get that information from these tools that are immersed in the patient? It's a horrible environment for sensing. Um, the cable drives on the robotic arms are very high friction, very nonlinear. And so, and then your, your signal, to detection, signal detection ratio is, or signal to noise ratio is awful. Right? The signal you're interested in are these very small scale forces, and you've got all this friction in the system that's impeding that. The, probably the more challenging thing, though, would be FDA approval. <laughs> right? As soon as you do force feedback, you've got an active system. You've got a closed loop between the operator and the patient. And you've got feedback going both ways. So position forward and force feedback. There's a chance for instability in a system like that, and getting that through FDA approval, I think, is going to be a huge challenge. Yeah, I, wor I worry a little about uh, prototypes. You have this quote up here, and I would say that probably a series of prototypes are often not progress at all. In other words, you have a series of people, they reinvent the wheel, 
uh, they just run into other other problems. It looked like a lot of the stuff here was prototype. Is that a fair thing to worry about? Or? It's a fair statement that the images and videos that I showed were kind of university research lab prototypes. With one exception, and that's the Sarcos exoskeleton, that's an industry, uh, that's a company in Utah that is making commercial robotic systems. And of course, the intuitive Da Vinci system is a commercial system. I think everything starts in the lab, and currently, there's the market isn't there to support kind of industrial level development of these systems, but you've got to start somewhere. And so it's, it's uh, federally funded research with very small targeted audiences, and I think that's where you have to start. And so there definitely has been progress in these systems in the last 10 years especially. And looking at where the funding is targeted and where uh, the energy of the community is targeted, I think we're going to see significant strides in the next 10 years. And you know, ultimately see this come out into the public. How would the teleoperators deal with signal delay between here and Mars? Um, in the systems that you see uh, for the Robonaut teleoperation system, um, even the JPL rovers, when they do the teleoperation, it's only a position forward command. There's no coupled force feedback. You're getting a video feed. And even with significant delay of a couple hundred milliseconds that you would have, um, you just move slowly. Uh, you compensate for that delay by slowing down your command signals so that you aren't getting unexpected motion of the slave based on the commands that you apply. If you start to integrate force feedback into that system, then you've got to do other compensatory techniques to mitigate that delay. There are a couple of approaches. Uh, none have been hugely successful because there's still a limit to how much delay is tolerable. And unless you've got some kind of dedicated communication link that's ensuring you know, constant loop rate and a set known delay, then you really are screwed, basically. <laughs> I'd like to suggest that the most uh, widespread and successful prosthetics are cognitive ones, namely computers. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Um, I will comment briefly, and I think that's a very interesting and insightful comment, and I'm actually going to punt that to Mike. <laughs> Being a cognitive psychologist. Well, it's certainly the case that, that uh, I would re readily agree with you that the most successful prosthetics have been cognitive prosthetics, but, and, and one of the reasons that there's all kinds of cognitive prosthetics that have been very successful that aren't even computers. I mean, paper is probably maybe even more successful as a cognitive prosthetic, right? I mean, you want to in decrease the incidence of accidents on commercial jetliners, you make pilots go through checklists that are on paper instead of keeping everything in their head when they're trying to, you know, go through their pre-flight pre checklist. Um, you know, those capabilities are expanding rapidly. Um, the issue I think we're starting to run into with a lot of those as, as cognitive prosthetics is really we can now have access, you know, through worldwide networks to unbelievable amounts of information, but now it's a question of how do you get the right information at the right time. It's the selection problem has become enormously large. Uh, and so it's not clear how much more we, mileage we can get out of the things. I mean, you can buy machines that are so fast that it doesn't matter how fast they are for your day-to-day -day operations, but now the question is how do you get the right stuff at the right time? Thank you, all three of you for that matter. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't have any pictures, though, of the younger generation at work in competition. All the robotic cars trying to go across the Mojave Desert and the boat races and the kids having destruction derbies on television. Uh, where's the most promise here coming from the younger generation without government support or DARPA support? <laughs> um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. There are some wonderful um, programs for elementary, middle, and high school kids, and uh, mobile robot design competitions. Um, personally, I feel like the purpose of these competitions is really to get and keep kids interested in science and engineering. And I hope that they're succeeding. Um, our enrollment numbers say they are. Um, but <clears throat> uh, what I was uh, trying to show here was really kind of how do we go beyond and really think about 
um, what's happening in terms of extending our own human capability. Um, it's, I find it refreshing to think that this is being inspired in the younger generation as well. And I thank you for pointing that out. More questions? So, uh, I've got a question. <laughs> so, um, if, if you can control rats and you can get monkeys to control arms by accessing their brain, at what point can you control humans? And how do you, how are people, how, how, how much resistance do you think you'll get to ideas like, like replacing your, your real arm with a prosthetic arm that is more powerful and how will you safeguard against people abusing the, the ability to like hack into someone's mind and control their actions or something, you know, crazy? Yeah, you actually mentioned something. Um, as I was kind of gathering um, my information for this presentation, the, the proposal that these brain interfaces be used for things like assassination was proposed. And it really makes you step back and think. I mean, no longer do you have to overcome your own um, series, you know, series of values yeah, and morals. Right. You just control yourself to go off and do something you wouldn't don't otherwise do. Right. There are some technical limitations to these interfaces right now. The electrodes don't stay in place okay. very well. Um, they degrade over time. And so while these work in the lab, as was mentioned, you know, in a prototype setting, we're not ready for prime time, even with the rat control and the, the primate example that I showed. But that's where the active research is, is how do you do these interfaces? And I'm glad you brought it up again. I really think it's important that we couple these discussions with where uh, brain control and prosthetics and mobile robots are going with a discussion of ethics. And rather timely, the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society has just launched a committee on robo-ethics to deal with a lot of these issues. So, I think it's encouraging that the community of robotics researchers has not abandoned the ethics issue, but it certainly needs to be carried with it throughout the development. Further questions? Although, if an individual chooses to modify themselves and has the resources to do it, is that not their prerogative? <laughs> <laughs> it's our right, is it not? I mean. I, I, we, there, are, you know, we're uh, Bud Frazier and I in the lab are working on a continuous flow total artificial heart. It's two little turbines. I mean, what is the big limitation to how much energy you and how much work you can put out? Is the efficiency for you to be able to deliver nutrients and oxygen and get rid of waste, metabolic waste, right? If you had a heart that could indefatigably pump 15 liters a minute, tell me why at the 2025 Olympics there won't be stock and modified. <laughs> you know? it, it most certainly could be. Um, the DARPA prosthetics program is seeking to just match human capability, um, which is not yet achievable with prosthetics, but it's not, it's not infeasible that you could replace your own arm or, for that matter, add a third arm. Um, <laughs> I mean, we augment ourselves in all sorts of ways right now, and it, it is a question to consider as to how far this, this may go, and what's going to have to be regulated and, and, and controlled. Okay, we have one more question. One of the more interesting discussions in science and technology now is in uh, human versus robotic exploration of space, and, and how do you balance that? I'm wondering if you'd care to weigh in on that as to whether they're getting it right, and if not, in what direction are they missing it? That's a very dangerous question with my colleague in the back of the room. <laughs> um, I think you have to consider what, what is gained or lost when you choose what you're going to send out for exploration. <clears throat> for example, you know, currently the, the Mars rovers there was not a feasible way to send humans to Mars, but there was a feasible way to send robots to Mars. And so as, a, as an inter, um, you know, a, as a step between what we could ultimately achieve, we had this robotic solution that enabled us to learn a lot about the environment and probably enable moving towards a manned mission to Mars uh, more readily. I don't think you can completely rule out human exploration of space 
because we're naturally curious and we're naturally explorers. And there are always going to be a set of people who are willing to risk whatever it takes to take those risks and go into space and do that exploration. And it's important that we have individuals like that who can bring back information. Uh, one of the experiences I had when I worked at NASA was to interact with a few astronauts. And if you ask them, would you do a one-way trip to Mars, knowing that you couldn't come back, it was amazing to me how many said yes. Just for the knowledge that would be gained and the experiences that would be had by taking that one-way trip. And so I think there's, you have to leverage here the risks that astronauts and trained people like that are willing to take versus the risks that the public is willing to deal with. And so it's an interesting question, but I think you're going to have a joint solution of robotic and human exploration to really advance um, exploring the rest of space. Well, thank you very much.